Welcome back to m and Corner. I'm delighted to be joined by my partner and colleague, David Wiles, who heads our operations in EMEA. David, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be back in New York. I thought we could talk a little bit about the m and environment in Europe and in the UK in particular, since this is a rare opportunity to have you in our New York offices today. Can you touch a little bit on what you're seeing in the UK in particular? Obviously, it's been a remarkable year in terms of an election cycle that finally has the Tories out of power. How does that influence how people think about business locally, and how does it affect the M&A market, if at all, in the UK? I think there is some optimism that um, we've now got a government that has a, a longer term time horizon. Um, the UK, I guess, consistent with many markets, needs um, you know, a real industrial policy around investment, particularly enabling investments that support business. And I think the uh, previous government was on much more of a sort of uh, cycle of managing um, by month, by month, by month, whereas the new government's come in with a large majority, potentially for two terms, and therefore they can start thinking about life with a 10-year time horizon. And I think if you look at where the UK economy is, um, we're pretty much taxed to the eyeballs. We're borrowed to the limit. So the only way you can fund a social plan is really through growth. And, and the hope is that the new Labour government will deliver on more of a growth orientated investment plan. But people are sitting back and waiting to see how that will manifest itself. We've got an important budget coming up in October, just before your election in November. And the US obviously has an implication uh, around, uh, around the UK as well, given the sort of codependency of, um, of us on, uh, on North America. So there's a lot of sort of um, to play for around that October, November timeframe. Uh, and I think you know, going into the summer, people backed off in terms of making decisions and um, you know, being front footed. And I think if we get the right answer through the budget in the UK, and the markets respond well to whatever happens to, uh, to the election here in North America, then I think people will feel more optimistic about going into the latter part of this year and into 25. It's definitely something different if you're talking about two terms for a government instead of one head of lettuce. So I applaud you for that new stability. Can you talk a little bit about how large corporations in the UK think about making strategic decisions, in particular inorganic opportunities? You look at the FTSE, and obviously it's probably the most global index out there in terms of what those companies do and where they operate. How do they think about the world relative to you know, a smaller company that might trade on AIM, for instance? So it is very different. I think um, you know, if you look at most FTSE companies, they probably have less than 10% and in some cases less than 5% of their revenues and profits in the UK. So the leadership team, the boards are impacted just like we all are by what's going on in our local environment. But really what's driving decision making is, um, is the global economy. And, and today when we think about the global economy, it's really the US is the most important thing. So for most of our large cap corporates and clients, it's the US that they're most focused on. It's the most dynamic market. It's also where more innovation is taking place relative to, um, to any other region. Um, you know, almost sort of, uh, if you compare and contrast to where we've been in the last 10, 20 years, I think Europe has gone backwards a little bit in terms of, of innovation and bringing new ideas to market. You know, the US with the IRA Act and other initiatives really stolen the march, not just on technology, but increasingly around energy and energy transition. So North America is a really important theme for most of our um, larger caps. You then flip the switch a little bit. Obviously, if we're dealing with sort of smaller or more regionally focused businesses, then obviously the UK economy does have quite a dramatic um, impact on how they think about live, lives. And we've been through a few, you know, two very, very big shocks in, um, in, in the UK in the last sort of five years, not just COVID, which we all experience globally, but but also Brexit, which was, um, you know, from an economic perspective, an exercise in quite significant self-harm um, in terms of what it did to the um, to GDP and GDP growth. Now that's starting to unwind, and the UK is now back getting to a higher uh, level of, uh, of growth relative to some of its more natural peers on the continent. So that's sort of starting to, to correct, but, um, but that GDP lag has definitely sort of um, been there for quite some time. You know, it's interesting, and maybe it's just a function of how the equity markets operate in both the U.S. and in the U.K. and the underlying health of the economies, but there was a bit of a valuation gap that started to develop with those FTSE 100 companies where you felt like they weren't trading at a level they would be trading at if they were on the New York Stock Exchange or on the NASDAQ. If you look at that as an opportunity for someone to come from overseas and invest into one of these U.K. companies, how protectionist is this government going to be relative to past governments? Obviously, we have something called CFIUS here, which is designed to prevent sort of takeovers of sensitive industries. It frankly has been expanded now because it's become a political tool. 
as we're seeing in Nippon Steel. But is there that same dynamic that exists in the UK or is it a little bit more open for investment from overseas? I think it's a little bit more open generally. It's been our mindset for, for a number of years, but we do have similar CFIUS type legislation. Um, uh, it's been expanded in recent years. Just like here, it, there's a political dimension. It has to be signed off by the um, by the Secretary of State. So there is very much that. I think you know that so far has been very focused on sensitive industries and um, geopolitical sensitivities, um, particularly China, um, in terms of uh, of, uh, of anything where this state backing. There was a recent uh, example of uh, the sale of the Telegraph newspaper group, um, which was uh, originally going to be sold um, to, um, to a, a pool of capital out of the Middle East, but it was essentially a state-backed pool of capital, and that got caught out in, uh, in, in the rules, and it wouldn't have necessarily happened that way a decade ago, but um, there's definitely a, a sort of look through, and if there is a state involvement in an industry, um, then that becomes much, much more problematic, and anything with a defense, or with an energy security um, dimension is, is is also difficult, but more broadly, well, you can still buy a soccer team. You can still buy a soccer team, and um, you know, and, and most global industries, particularly in, in areas like healthcare and in most industrial um, segments in consumer, then you know we are not by inclination a protectionist um, society. But we will interestingly see how the new Labour government responds and reacts. And whereas the Conservative government previously was. Um, uh, was more interventionist than many conservative administrations have been in the past. Uh, the new Labour administration is probably going to have a higher focus on uh, on transactions that impact on labour. Um, so if, if, if it impacts, you know, steel is a classic, just like it is here for us there, um, a reasonably large employer still and an industry that's in somewhat decline. And so, you know, those industries which have large employment, large labor components are probably going to get a higher level of, um, of scrutiny from this government than perhaps the last. Uh, I just want to ask you a little bit, David, about private equity in the UK and in Europe more generally. Can you talk a little bit about its function in the market, its prevalence in the market? Obviously, it's really important to the U.S. deal-making environment. Can you talk a little bit about what it means in the European context? So very, very similar. Um, you know, Europe always has followed the U.S. and um, you know, in that particular area as well. So all of the big global private equity firms are strongly present in London and in Europe. Um, you know, deal activity is 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 driven. You know, they're a catalyst for change, whether that be um, businesses that need to restructure and therefore they're a natural home for a division that's not necessarily part of a core um, strategic direction going forwards, um, whether it's to create sort of consolidation platforms to sort of help accelerate um, consolidation that needs to take place in, in, in other industries. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a very significant part of what's driving, um, you know, deal activity. You know, I think that um, just like here in the US, businesses are more comfortable being private for longer, mm. and there's no real need necessarily for a company to become public in order for, to deliver on its strategy and to raise capital. In fact, you, know, you might argue that um, you know, a 20% ownership of a listed company is less liquid than a 20% ownership of a private company these days. So that dynamic is definitely a play, and um, you know, private equity have the ambition to do large transactions. So you know, size is not as an, much of an impediment to, um, to getting deals done with private capital in the way that it, it used to be. Um, and so um, it's a very important part of the market for us. Volumes have been muted in the US over the course of 2024 and probably a little bit disguised by very large transactions that make up for a, a lower number of volume in terms of number of deals that occur. Um, are you seeing something similar in the UK and in Europe generally? And how do you, if so, how do you see us coming out of that? What are the catalysts for that to improve? Probably even more so than North America. Um, so, um, you know, the combination of the political uncertainty in the UK, but also we've had quite a lot of political uncertainty in, um, in, in Germany with a, um, some issues around, um, you know, a lurch to the right in certain regional elections. We saw recently in France with, um, with Macron calling a snap election to try and rebalance against a, a, a lurch to the right through the European elections. So there's, there's quite a lot of sort of geopolitical you know, instability in, in Europe generally which you overlay on top, and that's held back um, deal activity. So 2023 was a bit of an air pocket from an M&A perspective if you look back over you know, a 10-year time horizon. And while 24 is looking a little bit better, it's slightly sort of um, 
the statistics are sort of slightly flattered by some larger transactions. So actually, deal activity is still relatively muted. I think there is a, a build-up of ambition to do more, and that sits with the corporates, but also sits very strongly with private equity. I think if there's some stability in, in North America, in particular on the back of the election, in a sense that um, you know America's open for business, then I think there's a very real prospect that in the latter part of this year, we start to see some improved volumes and moving into 2025, potentially significantly improved volumes. Yeah, well, I'm rooting for that as I'm sure you are because cross-border activity in particular has been a real hallmark of our firm and would love to see more activity all across the board. So um, with that, David, I wanna thank you for taking the time out of your day to talk with us today and look forward to the next occasion. Absolutely, nice to see you again.